Welcome to COM 404 Principles of Persuasion. In this video lecture, I'd like to detail social identity theory and how it might be used to mobilize identities or otherwise lead to constructive persuasive campaigns. To do that, I'll first overview the origins and key assumptions of social identity theory before next discussing some of the concepts associated with social identity theory and its key principles that set up the guidelines for its beliefs and expectations of the way that it theorizes the world. Finally, we'll talk about how we might apply social identity theory to revisit our understanding of framing and concepts like terministic screens or strategic discourse to better be able to understand identity mobilization and our contemporary and increasingly social mediated society. Social identity theory emerges out of the horrors of the Holocaust and comes from a theorist by the name of Henri Tajfel, who was a Polish Holocaust sufferer who witnessed firsthand the difficult experiences of being categorized into various different groups and the hierarchies of human suffering that those imposed on individuals who were subject to being labeled or subject to being categorized. Henri Taj fell from his deep experiences and suffering in the Holocaust, theorized social identity to be a group phenomenon which drives human motivations. Where previously we described the mode model of human motivation, or otherwise described things like strategic discourse, as always being about the way that a speaker might tailor their message to motivate an audience, the social identity theories proposed by Henri Tajfel and others indicate that our ideas of motivation aren't always rational, constructed through a central route, or even otherwise informed by cultural narratives or peripheral heuristics as described by elaboration likelihood modeling, but instead sometimes individual motivations are indoctrinated or are otherwise created by collective social structures. And so individuals like Henri Tajfel and social identity theorists like him otherwise built an incredible body of research that describes the way human motivations are often structured or otherwise organized by societal and collective belief systems. There are three principal assumptions of social identity theory. The first one is that when individuals are unable to achieve their goals or otherwise frustrated by the efforts they have in society to achieve status, they often displace that frustration onto other individuals as they see those individuals hierarchically organized above them or below them. In this sense, social identity theorists assume that goal frustration motivates people to displace their aggression onto others. The second assumption that social identity theorists tend to have is that group membership or the very labeling or categorization of identity tends to produce practices of communication that in and of themselves constitute our sense of membership and create or otherwise undergird our senses of self. Simply said, being put into an us or a them categorizes in us in ways that influences or changes our attitudes, our behaviors, and our possible motivations. And the third and final assumption that relates to social identity theory comes from realistic conflict theory. If you're not familiar with realistic conflict theory, perhaps you're familiar with the theory of mutually assured destruction. The theory of mutually assured destruction emerges from the 1970s and 80s Cold War with Russia and suggests that if the United States and Russia both had nuclear weapons and if either country were to use them it would risk nuclear annihilation for the whole globe, then the consequences of otherwise losing the entire planet would outweigh any potential disagreement between the two countries and so they would be forced to cooperate or otherwise compromise to avoid an even worse scenario. In this regard, realistic conflict theory suggests that when two different groups or two opposing forces are met with an even larger dilemma, they'll find some sort of way to come together, collaborate, and avoid the worst scenario that they face. If the scenario of mutually assured destruction didn't work for you as an example, perhaps you could think about something like the risk of an alien invasion and the likelihood that if such a thing were to happen, the hope might be that all countries of the world would assemble, despite their various differences, to ward off the invasion of a third party coming from perhaps the Martians or elsewhere. In this sense, both in the Martian example and also in theories of mutually assured destruction, realistic conflict theory helps create the worldview assumption that when people are provoked or challenged by an even larger problem, they come together cooperatively to solve their problems. 
One of the most interesting assumptions of social identity theory is that simply being labeled into a group creates a sense of reality for those individuals who are now contained or categorized within that group. Indeed, social identity theorists have labeled what they call the theory of minimal groups, which suggests that simply being labeled into an X or a Y, an A or a B, can otherwise influence your decision making. Say perhaps you walked into a classroom, and immediately upon walking into the classroom, the instructor ascribed you as an X and told you that you would be a member of the X group today, and ascribed several other students as they joined the classroom as a Y group. Perhaps you noticed that many of the individuals ascribed in the X group, like yourself, were also very intelligent individuals. You might assume then that the X group was the members of the best students selected by that instructor and that the Y group was a lesser than group of students. However, this would be a false dichotomy set up by your own improper logic or fallacy guiding you that the theory of minimal groups would lead you to suggest that simply being categorized or the mere act of being labeled can produce a sort of highly competitive or self centered behavior that leads to an us versus them dichotomy. You might think about the way that this us versus them tension has been exacerbated or otherwise benefited by folks like marketers and politicians who regularly use these sorts of teamsmanship to provoke not only opposition against their political parties, but also in the context of marketing and advertising, sales, and brand loyalty. So the assumption of minimal groups helps us understand at least four key premises of social identity theory. The first is that groups can form of all sizes and of all particular forms and still have a sense of social identity that motivates their behaviors and creates a certain sense of hyper-competitiveness. The second key premise here is that the collective behaviors of individuals within those groups tend to distinguish themselves from those who do not share group membership. In this sense, a sense of teamsmanship forms. I am an X, they are a Y, X's are like this, and Y's are like that. Not only is your personal self-identity formed in that comparison, but also a contrast is made that helps structure the identity of others. Third, we might note that when people make these sorts of comparisons between their own group and the other out-group, they tend to make distinctions that are otherwise quite favorable to themselves and otherwise hostile to out-groups. This sense of polarization is something that should be alarming to us and something as ethical producers of persuasion we seek to correct and tailor better messages to avoid. Finally, the fourth important premise of social identity theory to remember is that groups tend to use a number of different strategies to manage those subjective belief structures and there's simply no one effective message, no one theory of persuasion, or no simple way to tailor a message to reach everybody or all audiences ethically or effectively. Instead, as creators of ethical and effective persuasive messages, we have to get to know our audience and think carefully about sender messages and the receiving audience. Perhaps you're familiar with the recent Twix campaign that asks you to decide which side you're on, the side of the left Twix bar or the side of the right Twix bar. Of course, most informed consumers would know that there is no difference between the left or the right Twix bar, but instead that this is simply a marketing ploy. However, informed theorists of persuasion and communication might note that this is an effective use of social identity theory to draw groups and create discussion around a brand that might otherwise lead to brand affinity and product sales. In this sense, the Twix campaign is successful at mobilizing brand identities by creating some sense of controversy, playing off perhaps a cultural or contemporary moment, and leading its consumers into a dialogue or a discussion that might help connect them to the brand and, of course, increase sales. 